Revelation chapter 11. One of the things we're going to start doing now, you're going to notice it. Those of you that are, have been coming for a while, you know that at times I kind of tend to talk a long time here. But what that does, it puts a lot of pressure on our kids' ministry people. And as the night goes later, the kids are getting tired, the little ones. and So we're going to do something a little bit different on all of our services. And that's going to be Thursday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday evening. We're going to teach at the most 40 minutes. The goal is going to be 30 minutes. Now, it takes a little bit longer to prepare when you cut it back. Those of you that teach know that. The less you teach, the more you have to study. So great. That's awesome. So anyway, it'll be a little bit more preparing for the Sunday night, guys. A little bit more preparing to do it, but that's what we're going to do. So we're going to cut it back a little bit. It'll also help people that are saying, I've got to get up in the middle of the service and go to the bathroom. No, you can hold 30 minutes. It's, it's, it's a sitcom. You can do it. Okay, so we're going to just hang on, and we're going to get into the Word. Because we're only going 30 minutes tonight, we're going to cover two verses. So Revelation study just became an eight-year study. So here we go. <laughs> chapter 11 of Revelation. It says in chapter 11, verse 1, John is writing. Remember, he has just had a chance to eat that little book in his stomach to become bitter. It tasted sweet, became bitter and all. A couple of weeks ago, we saw that. It says now in chapter 11, verse 1, Then John says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod. Now, given a reed like a measuring rod, this reed is a reed-like plant that still today grows in the Jordan River Valley. And it's a, it's a hollow, rigid, lightweight, like almost a bamboo type of thing, but it's got three kind of angles on it, three little sides to it, like a triangle. And it goes up and can go 15, sometimes 20 feet long. Sometimes it was used as a walking stick. It's that rigid. We saw that in Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 6. In John chapter 3, 3 John 13, there we go. In 3 John 13, John speaks of it as a pen. Same word. And that's what they oftentimes would do. They would whittle it down, this reed, and make a writing pen. A writing instrument, dip it in the ink and write with it. And it's that same reed. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 40, all the way through 43, when we look at the temple that will be built during the millennial reign of Jesus, we see that that same reed, the walking stick reed, the whittle down pen reed, was used as a measuring rod. And the measuring rod, interestingly enough, was six cubits. A cubit, remember, was the distance from the, the uh, tip of your middle finger to your elbow, about 18 inches. And if it was six cubits, and that's about nine feet, and it was a nine foot measuring stick, and you would measure whatever it is you wanted to measure. It was like a yardstick, but it was a little bit longer. And John says, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. So probably this six-cubit reed he was given. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there, but leave out the court which is outside the temple. Don't measure it. For it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. That's how much we're covering tonight. So we've been given this reed, this measuring rod, and he's told, rise and measure. In the Old Testament, we saw it in our Sunday morning study a while back in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 2. Remember when David had measured off the Ammonites in two different lines, remember? And oftentimes, the word measure in the Old Testament, Testament is used to measure something for destruction. That's very typical in the Old Testament. You measure something so you can destroy it. But, in verse 2, we just read, leave out the court which is outside the temple. Don't measure that. It's been given to the Gentiles. That's the part that is going to get in trouble. So we see the measuring in verse 1 is not for destruction. Far from that, it seems to be something that is measured out to signify ownership, much like it was in Zechariah chapter 2, the first five verses, when God, through Zechariah, instructs him to measure for ownership. Much like we're going to see in Revelation chapter 21, when we're going to see, with a golden rod now, the new Jerusalem being measured out for ownership. So it's kind of interesting, here it appears, that this is being measured out The temple and the true 
Israeli worshipers in the midst of the tribulation, it appears they're being measured out for salvation, being measured out for some type of special protection, being measured out for some certain type of protection, protection, preservation, salvation. But he says, the angel said, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. The word temple is naos. There are some who point to this and say, well, you understand that we as Christians are the temple of God. So he's talking basically about the Christians, and it's a way of placing the Christians in the midst of the tribulation, putting the church in the midst of the tribulation. However, when we look at this, it says, uh, measure the temple of God. And in the book of Revelation, whenever it is possible, it is best to take what it says literally, unless it's obviously a picture. The word naos here refers to the inner temple throughout the scripture. The naos, the holy place and the holy of holies. He says, measure that. And measure the altar. This would be the bronze altar that would be outside the naos, outside the inner sanctuary. The altar of sacrifice. He says, rise, measure the temple of God, measure the altar, and those who worship there. We remember that in the holy place only the priests could go. In the holy of holies, only the high priest on the Day of Atonement. And as you look at the temple structure, at the very beginning was the court of the Gentiles, where Gentiles could go. But then there was a wall, and past that wall, a Gentile better not go. <coughs> if he did, there was a stone plaque that warned the Gentiles, if you go past this, you are choosing to bring death upon yourself. <coughs> In the days of Jesus, Rome gave the nation of Israel, the authority to kill Gentiles who went past that wall. That stone that said that, they just found in Israel not long ago. A week and a half ago, we saw it. It's like, what? Look, there it is. They found it. So it's there. One of the things that is one of the biggest things, I was, I was flying back from, uh, from Israel, and Connie and I were on this side of the aisle. We're going from New York to Minneapolis, and across the aisle, all tired but excited, was a young lady, the gal that was playing on the keys tonight. There was Randy Lynn. She's sitting there. And she was, like, devouring the scriptures. Devouring them. And I was looking at her. I kept looking at her. Man, she's devouring these things. You need to calm herself over there. <laughs> and I just kept watching her. She just kept... I said, Randy Lynn, what are you reading? This is amazing. This is amazing. I'm in the book of Matthew. I've read, I've read three books already, three entire books in the Bible. And I've already read Matthew. I'm reading it again. Yeah. I said, you liking it? I'm reading about Capernaum right now. The Sea of Galilee, Capernaum. This is so exciting. I know right where that is. I can, I can see it. This is real. All excited. All excited. <laughs> it was one of the more exciting moments I had on the trip, just watching Randy Lynn devouring the Bibles. Like, check her out devouring that Bible over there. But it, it's just sweet. Well, when they found this stone, it does the same, has the same impact. It's real. They found that stone. So you have the court of the Gentiles that only up to that wall could Gentiles go. Then Jews could go through the door into what is known as the court of the women. So any Jew could go in there, man or woman alike. <laughs> But then as you got in deeper and deeper, you got to another section where women were not allowed to go. And then you got to the place where only priests were allowed to go. And we see here, he says, rise and measure the temple of God. He's going out the other way, from the inner sanctuary to the altar, to the outer part, and those who worship there. So worship just the part where the Jewish folks are worshiping. How exciting this vision that John had had to be. Because remember, he had this vision in the 90s. The temple, we're going to look at the temple in just a minute, the, the center of Judaism had been destroyed just 20 years earlier. There was no temple. And now as John in this vision, he sees this angel say, go measure the temple. Measure the holy place. Measure the altar. Measure the people that are worshiping in the midst of this time of Jacob's trouble. 
How encouraging for John. And as we look at this, I want to just take a couple of minutes and remind ourselves on the important role the temple plays in Scripture. The first temple, built in 1050 B.C., we're, we're looking at the life of David now on our Sunday morning study, and we remember that David wanted to build a house for God, and God, through Nathan, said, you're going to build me a house? I didn't ask for a house. I'm going to make a house out of you. And gave him a house, remember, uh, the house of David. He says, but David, you're a man of war. You're disqualified from building a house. But your son, he'll build it. And he did. Solomon built that first temple, finished up in 1050 B.C. Solomon built it, remember, in the threshing floor of Arauna to the north of the city of David. And what later became known as the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, the place that most people believe Abraham brought Isaac and offered Isaac, or was ready to offer Isaac when God stopped him there in Genesis 22. So there sits the first temple. That temple was destroyed a little over 400 years after it was built by the Babylonians, remember, in 586 B.C. Then, in a period between 538 and 510 B.C., a second temple was built on its spot. That second temple built by a man by the name of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel should have been the king of Israel, but because of the Babylonian captivity and the judgment of God on a nation, that whole kingly line was not in a position to rule again. But Zerubbabel and the high priest by the name of Joshua, not the Joshua of the Old Testament that we're familiar with, but a high priest with that same name, they started to build on Mount Moriah the second temple. And that second temple was uh, finished. When it was finished, the younger generation were so excited. They were so excited. We got that temple back. But as old folk, those, I was talking with Judy. Judy and I got to be about the same age. Judy, you and I both have got to be 45 to 50 years old. We got to be right there. But Judy was talking, I remember you from the radio years ago, and we were talking about the Calvary Chapel movement and the worship of the 70s, and just talking about the old time. And, and there's that same type of thing going on with the temple. The people that had seen the first temple, while the young people said, this new temple is awesome, those that had seen the original temple started to cry. Because this is nothing like the first temple at all. In fact, as we read, we see that it wasn't as glorious as the first temple. In fact, it didn't have the glory. The ark wasn't there. The human and thummim wasn't there. And it's a constant reminder of the consequences of sin. The lost potential can still be used. It was still a temple and was used to worship, but the lost potential of sin. The nation of Israel had fallen into sin. The temple was back so much less than it once was, so much less than it could have been. The second temple. It's kind of interesting, as we look at the second temple, time goes by, and then in the first century, Herod gets the idea, right around the beginning of the first century, Herod, King Herod, he was a, uh, can anybody think of any words to describe him? A megalomaniac, schizophrenic, paranoid, or paranoid, schizophrenic. A megalomaniac, paranoid, schizophrenic. Yeah, our tour guide, David, said that every time we talked about Herod. That's what he was. But anyway, any rate, there's Herod. And he gets the idea that he's going to remodel Zerubbabel's temple, the second temple. And he does something very interesting. He spends decades doing it. In fact, the entire time Jesus is alive on the earth, the temple is under construction. It's a remodel project. It's not finished until 66 AD. 30, 30 plus years after the crucifixion of Jesus is the remodel of the temple finished. So it's in this remodel state, but Herod makes it really nice. I mean, he just puts everything he can into it. He expands Zerubbabel's temple. Many people refer to it as the third temple, the expansion 
of Zerubbabel's temple. The Jews never refer to that as the third temple. Never. In fact, it was pointed out to us very clearly. Do not ever call that temple the third temple. We, that was pointed out to us by our Jewish tour guide a couple of weeks ago. And I just looked. I think it was either Walter or Anthony. One of us just kind of exchanged smiles. And we just, don't say anything. That's very important. It cannot be the third temple because the Jewish teaching is Messiah is going to come when the third temple is up. And if that's the third temple, that means Messiah had to come during before 70 AD. He had to come somewhere between during the first century. And obviously he didn't. Wait a minute, he did. I just find that so interesting. So to the Jew, they don't call it the third temple. It's the remodeled second temple period. Okay. As a Christian, I call it the third temple. Because it is. That's what it is. Then there is the destruction of this temple in 70 AD. It was prophesied by Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 2, when he said there will not be one stone left on top of another and all. And we've studied that in great detail in the past. Do you remember where Titus is the... Jerusalem is being destroyed. He gives strict instructions to his soldiers, do not destroy the third temple. And one of the soldiers carelessly starts it on fire. The gold melts. The fire is so hot. Runs into the cracks of the stones. The Roman soldiers actually push the stones off the temple mount to get to the gold. And not one stone is left on top of another, fulfilling the prophecy that Jesus made in Matthew 24, 2. An interesting, interesting account given to us by Josephus. So those are the temples up to now. Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, and the remodeled temple. Very important to keep that in our mind as you're reading in the Bible. Now, there is another temple coming. The Jews refer to it as the third temple. It will be built on the Temple Mount. Since 70 AD, it's been the Jewish desire to have the temple rebuilt on the Temple Mount three times a day. If you've ever seen any of the Jews at the Western Wall praying and they're doing this, this bobbling, or if you're on a plane and all of a sudden you'll, you'll hear the bins open up, it's, it's prayer time, and they will face towards Jerusalem and they will take their phylacteries and wrap themselves in phylacteries and they'll start to pray. What they were praying is called the Amada prayer. And part of that prayer is 18 different prayer requests. They've now bumped it up to 19 requests. But one of those re requests is that the temple will re be rebuilt. Because they believe that when Messiah comes, that in what they call third temple will be standing. And they do believe that Messiah will have a lot to do with the building of that temple. In fact, when you talk to Jews, Orthodox Jews today, you say, how are you going to recognize who the Messiah is? How will you know? And they say it's very simple. It'll be the man, and they call him the man, it'll be the man who allows that temple to be built on the Temple Mount. That's very interesting because... Scripture, we're going to see as we go through the book of Revelation, tells us that the Antichrist himself will enter into a contract with the nation of Israel and will allow the temple to be built on the Temple Mount. And the nation of Israel will enter into allegiance and a covenant with him. The word anti, remember, means two things, against and instead of. And in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, the Antichrist will be seen by the nation of Israel as taking the position of the true Messiah, the true anointed one. 
And then we will be looking and we'll see in the midst of the tribulation, the Antichrist will take the throne on the Temple Mount and demand worship of himself. At that point, the nation of Israel will realize, oh my. Their veil will be lifted. The 144,000 will be doing missionary work. We're going to see next week the two witnesses are going to be used by God in a tremendous way to present the gospel. And the Antichrist, instead of being seen instead of Christ, will now turn all of his vengeance on those who have come to Christ after the rapture of the church. And he will turn on those who are following Christ. Not the church. The church is gone. But the tribulation believers, the tribulation saints. He will go after the nation of Israel and those who have come to Christ in a very strong way. This fourth temple, or the third temple, the temple that will be built next on the Temple Mount, will be built sometime during the first half of the tribulation under the protection, support, and encouragement of the Antichrist. This past couple of weeks, we had a pleasant surprise to find out that the Temple Institute is alive and well in Israel. And we had the opportunity to go there to see the instruments that will be used in this temple. This temple that the nation of Israel is preparing to use, believing that this temple will be on the Temple Mount soon. In fact, in the Midrash, it tells us that the Messiah must arrive 6,000 years after creation, which they peg somewhere around 2240 A.D., or A.D. 2240. He's got to come before then, according to Jewish writings. So they're preparing. They're preparing. And you, you can see so many of the instruments that will be used. The table of showbread, the menorah, the altar of incense. A mock-up of the Ark of the Covenant. They believe when they have the temple, God will bring the Ark of the Covenant forward and it will be there. They're training the priests... Remember the priest, the name in Hebrew is Cohen. So if you know any Cohens, those are the priests. They are the ones who are being trained. The Cohens are being trained for temple worship, even now. So it's an interesting, exciting thing. Not that the, the temple worship is going to be going on, because no, that's not good. Jesus paid the sacrifice already. But it shows us how close we are. It shows us how close we are. It's like, whew, this is pretty cool right here. That's the fourth temple. That's the temple that is going to be there during the tribulation. That's the temple that the Antichrist is going to set up the abomination of desolation. We're going to talk about that going forward. That's that temple. Then there is another temple we mentioned briefly earlier, the fifth temple in Scripture, and that is the temple that will be built during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, those thousand year, that thousand-year reign of Jesus, where Satan will be bound for real for a thousand years. And there will be a temple that we see described in Ezekiel chapter 40 all the way through chapter 48, the millennial temple where the Lord will reign. So we have these five different temples that, that show up in Scripture. Five temples. Well, here, when John has this vision, the remodeled Zerubbabel temple, call it the second temple re remodeled or the third temple, whatever you call it, that one, the one that was destroyed in 70 AD is gone. And John sees this vision. This temple that will be built under the protection of the Antichrist during the first half of the tribulation. He says, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court, which is outside the temple. For it has been given to the Gentiles. Do you realize how important that verse is right there, guys? That is one of the strongest verses for the rapture of the church in all the scripture right there. Based on Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, that tells us, let's, let's take a look at that. Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. And this is the nugget. If you're a new believer, just write it down and have fun with it. 
But this is that little piece of meat, you know, when you go to a restaurant and you have the salad and you have the soup and then you have the potatoes and then you have that one little piece of meat that's like, mm -hmm. the good one? It's the one you have to get the big bottle of ketchup for? No, but you get, the, you get the good piece. Here's a good piece of spiritual meat right here. This is just another of many. But take a look at Colossians chapter 3. He says in verse 8, but now you yourselves are to put off all these. He says, okay, as Christians, don't do this anymore. What? Put off anger, put off wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie one to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and you have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither, what now? Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. There is no distinction in the church between a Jew and a Gentile. The church is the church. There are three groups of people. Remember, there's the Jews, there's the Gentiles, and there's the church. And in the church, there's no distinction made. We go back to Revelation and notice there's a distinction. Leave out the court... But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. Why the distinction? Because there's no church. The church is gone. The church has been raptured. What's left are the Jews or unbelievers and the Gentiles, and from there will come the tribulation saints, but not the church. There will be distinction between Jews and Gentiles alike. Leave out of the court which is outside the temple. Don't measure that. It has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot. A.T. Robertson, one of the Greek scholars, he says in one of his articles that the phrase, they will tread underfoot, means to stomp with contempt. It's having contempt. So during this time, there will be strong contempt towards the Jews and towards Jerusalem. They will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. 42 months, that's the equivalency in scripture, prophetic time is 1,260 days. It's equivalent to three and a half years. 42 months. It's the time of the Antichrist against Christ reign. So we start to see now this last half of the tribulation. And at the end of the 42 months is going forward, we're going to see that Jesus will return. He will return and destroy the Antichrist. Jesus will return and judge the nations. He will establish the millennial reign. He will build that fifth temple we talked about over in Ezekiel 40 to 48. In Daniel chapter 20, we see something so, or chapter 12, we see something so interesting. In Daniel chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, there are some more days mentioned. But instead of 1260, we add another 30, and it says 1,290 days, and then we add again another 30 plus half of 30 for another 45, and we come up to whatever that turns out to be, 1,325, whatever it is. But it's another 45 days, 35, I guess. And there's an interesting thing with this, this gap here, and there's all kinds of conjecture what's going on we don't know. Most people believe that gap is from the time that Jesus returns until he establishes the millennial reign as it gathering the nations of the world together, getting the believers together, as it judging the nations and the people individually in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, all this time to set up the millennial reign. But then Daniel says, but man, blessed is the one that gets to that millennial reign. Blessed is that one. So during these last three and a half years, where he tells John, measure for possession, for protection, for preservation, for salvation. Measure that group those last three and a half years. Measure that, John. As we get into the next chapter, in chapter 12, we're going to see Satan going after the nation of Israel at this point. And we're going to see that the Bible tells us that God's going to open up the earth and provide protection as the, as the enemy, Satan himself, tries to drown out God's people, the nation of Israel, during the tribulation. And how God's going to preserve them in the wilderness. He's got a place for them in the wilderness. Don't know where that is. Many people believe it's Petra. 
Many people believe those back roads of Petra with all those caves and all those different places is the place that God has already prepared to protect Israel during the last three and a half years when they come to recognize Jesus as their Messiah. So next week as we look at all this, we're going to see that God is going to use two witnesses. And these two witnesses, man, they're amazing. They're just amazing. We're going to look and see who they might be. We're going to see what they do, what happens to them, how God uses them. It's pretty crazy. So, one of the next big things we want to look for, guys, is the rebuilding of the temple on the Temple Mount. That's kind of a big moment, something to be looking for as Christians. That's why it was so exciting to go into the Temple Institute and see that the nation of Israel is ready to go. They even have the plans drawn for the temple. The plans are drawn. It's ready to go. I just don't know if the Jews can come up with enough money to build it, but if they can... That's a joke. They got it. But it's going to be there. They've got everything ready to go. It's ready to go. Twenty, about 21 years ago it was now I asked one of the people at the Temple Institute, how long will it take once you get the go to finish the temple? They, we figured less than 30 days from the time we say go to temple worship is established. That's how close this is. So that one of the next big events is going to be to see that temple being placed on the Temple Mount. There's just one real big obstacle. And whenever you look at a picture of Jerusalem, you, you see it. It's this big golden-looking dome that people like to take pictures of. Say, Isn't that beautiful? No, that's blasphemy. On that dome it says, God is one, he has no son. It's just blasphemy is what it is. I know it's not politically correct. I don't care, I'm not politically correct. That's blasphemy. It is one of the shrines. It was built in the late 600s over a rock. I've had a chance to go into that place, to go down where that rock is and see it. And it's a, it's a rock. It's a big old rock. The rock would probably fit in this room right here, kind of. It's a big old rock, outcropping of a rock. Judaism believes that that was the rock, Mount Moriah, that Abraham was brought to, where he laid Isaac on top of that rock. It was ready to slay Isaac, when God stopped him and provided a ram. It is that rock that Islam says was the place that Abraham took his son, not Isaac, but Ishmael, and offered him. They kind of changed the, the account. But in 600, AD 600, on that rock, this shrine was built. Now, it's important, I think, for us to just make sure we understand that the Dome of the Rock is not the third holiest site in Islam. The holiest site in Islam is in Mecca in Saudi Arabia. The second most holy site is Medina in Saudi Arabia. The third holiest site is in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, but it's not the Dome of the Rock. It's the mosque on the south side of the Dome of the Rock known as a distant place mosque or Al-Aqsa Al Mosque. The Al-Aqsa Mosque. That is, let's go ahead and put that, there it is. It's the Dome of the Rock, not the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The mosque is the holy site. The Dome of the Rock is a shrine placed on what many people in Judaism believe was the Holy of Holies. So putting the shrine there, they're saying, well, that's, that's ours. And it's like, well, now we got an issue. Now we have an issue. How to build a temple on an Islam shrine, knowing that if you destroy the Dome of the Rock, you have a billion radicals and people who are not radicals coming on in radically. You got yourself an issue. And therein lies one of the many problems. But the question is, is it really an obstacle? In the Hebrew University, one of the... Uh, professors there, his name was Asher Kaufman, came up with a theory, and it's a theory, but it's a very interesting theory. Reading the book of Ezekiel, he says, when I look at Ezekiel, it says that there's going to be a wall separating a profane from the rebuilt temple on the Holy Mount, on the, uh, on the uh, Temple Mount. 
And he says, as I looked at the Mishnah, the Mishnah says this, when the high priest stood in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, he could look through the veil, through the door, and see the eastern gate directly before him. So the Mishnah says that the Holy of Holies lined up with the eastern gate. When we go to Jerusalem today, we see something very, very interesting, and that is the eastern gate is blocked up. And of course, Christians see that, or people see that, and go, whoa, look at the eastern gate. They say, yeah, but that's not the eastern gate of Jesus' time. That's the eastern gate of the 1500s. It was, this whole wall was built by Suleiman the Magnificent. But what's really interesting is in Ezekiel 44, verse 1, it does say that the eastern gate will be closed, which is interesting. And this Suleiman the Magnificent closed it up with these blocks, cemented them in. He says, what, the, the Jewish Messiah is supposed to come to this gate? Block it up. That'll stop him. Yeah, there you go. I hate it when they do that. Come on now. But you know, it's just what it is. It's what it is. But we laugh at that, but how often do we think that the Lord is enabled to open up doors for us, you know? We look at it from our own perspective. But there he is. So we've got this gate, this door, the eastern gate, that he says from the Holy of Holies, you can see right through the gate and see the Mount of Olives. Well, when you go there and you stand where the temple or the Dome of the Rock is, the eastern gate doesn't line up. The eastern gate is way to the north. It's like, oh, that doesn't work. What's going on here? You say, well, Solomon, he must have, that's Suleiman the Magnificent, he must have put the gate further to the north when he rebuilt it. That, that guy, you know. Well, then guess what? In 1969, a guy by the name of Dr. James Fleming, he wasn't a doctor yet, he was a student at this time in Jerusalem. Heavy rains had hit on Jerusalem. He wanted some pictures along the wall and along that gate, that eastern gate that was there part of the Solomon, the magnificent gate, the one that was blocked up. And he's walking after this major rainstorm and some of the ground gives way and he falls down into a mass grave in the Muslim portion of the cemetery there. And he counts 46 skeletons in that grave. And as you read it, his account is just funny. He says, he was asked a question in this interview. He says, well, did, uh, did you take a picture? He says, no, no. I counted 46 skeletons, and I tried to find a way out so there wouldn't be 47. <laughs> He says, I, pff, I got out of there. Are you kidding me? But once I realized, okay, I'm out. So I went back in. I took some pictures. There's the pictures. He said, I brought it to my professor. He looked. He says, do you realize what you just found? So we don't have access to this, but look at this. You are exactly below the closed eastern gate, and there we see the remnant of the eastern gate from the first century, exactly below that eastern gate. Now, if you're tracking with me, that is so significant, you're going to be going to say, la. It's a big thing. Because what that means is the gate, the eastern gate, that the Mishnah says the high priest could look through, that means that the temple wasn't where the Dome of the Rock is. That means the temple was north of where the Dome of the Rock is. So we go and line up, and we do that every time. This time we didn't get to go on the Temple Mount because the Gentiles have control of it, and they wouldn't let us up there this time because of Ramadan and all this. But at any rate, when we have gone up there, it's one of the most amazing things, guys, because we go there. It's this huge platform. Think of many football fields. And we line up with the Eastern Gate. You can see it. And we line up with the Eastern Gate, and we go, okay, if we're going to line up the Eastern Gate, we're looking to the east now. We say that's the north because we're completely twisted here, but that's where we are. Well, that's, that's north, right? So let's look this way. Okay, we're looking at this way in the Temple Mount. And we're to the north. We look to the south of us, and there's the Dome of the Rock, and there's nothing here for a long ways. And we look straight out, and there's the blocked-up eastern gate. And the Mishnah says when the high priest stood in the Holy of Holies, he could look through the eastern gate, and he could see the Mount of Olives. So we go there today and we say, well, let's just stand here and there's the Dome of the Rock. Okay, Ezekiel says there's going to be a wall dividing. There could be a wall dividing. There's enough room. The temple dimensions fit here. But there's nothing here now except one little gazebo. A little gazebo sitting right there. Lined up exactly with that eastern gate. 
built by the Muslims. A little gazebo dome thing. And you ask, what's that called? They lost the Dome of the Spirits. And it's got another name too. It's called Dome of the Tablet. Well, why do you call it the Dome of the Spirits and the Dome of the Tablet? We well, don't know. That's just what we call it. I don't know. But what's interesting, dimension-wise, it's exactly, there's a little outcropping of a rock. It's exactly where the Holy of Holies would be. Where the Spirit of God would have rested and where the tablet, the Ten Commandments, would have been. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. No, I am saying, I'm saying. That's crazy. And it lines up exactly, exactly with the Eastern Gate. When you look at cities throughout the ancient world, the main gate to the city always led, always led to the temple, the main temple of the city. You never came into the temp to the gate, the main gate of the city, and then go off to the temple. It was always that was the center. And you come through the main gate, and there's that little dome of the spirit sitting there. It's an interesting, interesting thing to look at. The purpose for all this is: is it possible to have the rebuilt temple, the temple that? during the tribulation without the Dome of the Rock being blown up? It appears it could be. Now, not, not everyone adheres to that. Evangelicals really adhere to Asher Kaufman. When that came up, that was big news in evangelical circles. Big news. Because all of a sudden, there doesn't have to be a, an all-out Islam-Jewish war for the temple to be built. If the Antichrist, through the power of Satan, can be given the favor with the, in the Islam world to somehow say we're going to block it off and let them have their temple. Many of the Jews say, not a chance. Are we going to share the temple mount with Islam? The book of Ezekiel says, yeah, you're going to. Islam will say, we'll never let the Jews build the temple up there. The Bible says, yeah, you're going to. It's going to happen. And the Antichrist is going to pull it off. And the Jews say, how do we know who the Messiah is? He's going to be the one that allows us to build our temple. And the Bible teaches that the Jews will be fooled, deceived into thinking the Antichrist is their Messiah for three and a half years. And then the veil will be removed. So these first two verses in chapter 11, just an intro to where we're going, but very significant. Do you see that? Really significant. So uh, hang on. We'll cover a lot more next week. This was just kind of an intro. But we are so close, guys. We are so close. This is not a time to be playing with the Lord. This is not a time to be playing with your soul. This is not a time to be thinking, well, I don't think... <sighs> this is a time. I was, I was talking to Christina beforehand. Christina, we do want to publicly just give our sympathy to you, the loss of your... so many of your family members, but your brother most recently, and I'm trying to extend our sympathy to you on that. But... um. This is a time to be praying for our family members and our friends and telling people, you need to come hear the Word of God. This is a time for us to share the gospel with people. This is not a time to be playing. We are so close. So close. The stage is set. The next event is the rapture and the prophetic timetable. It's, that's next. It's next. It's next. Probably tonight. So be ready. Be ready. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a time just to, to get back into the book of Revelation, just to look at these two verses and get the stage set. Lord, as we look at this and we see another evidence that the rapture comes before the tribulation, that we are not here in the midst of your judgment on a Christ-rejecting world. As we see the dominoes being set up and just ready for everything to take place, it's so obvious. God, we do pray for the nation of Israel, Lord, that there would be peace there, that they could come to know you, Lord. We know you have a remnant in their midst, and God, we pray that that remnant would grow. God, we pray for our friends, our family. We pray for people in this church. We even might be praying for ourselves right now, God, that we would truly walk with you. Lord, that we would respond to your gift of love, that we would respond with love. Lord, that we be quick to love one another. Lord, that we would establish a testament. What an exciting time to be alive, God. Thank you for the privilege of living during this time. What a joy.
be able to come into your presence, to speak with you, to worship you, to have you come upon us and flow through us. Lord, thank you so much for your love. In Jesus' name.